Welcome to Neon Galactic, a podcast produced by PBS affiliate Key TV in Eureka, California. I'm your host, James Falk. Before we get started, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to this channel. Productions like this are made possible through the support of viewers and listeners like you. Over the hundreds of thousands of years that were humanity's coming of age, there has long been a potent interplay between the elements outside of us, every particle, pebble, rock, planet, and star, and those within, the coherencies of personality and essence, the spiritual gestalt. There's the phenomena we experience and the meaning we interpret or perceive through that phenomena and how it impacts our lives and our thinking. The, this mind-manner interaction over time, it now appears, allowed our species to penetrate some way into the deepest mysteries and identify those archetypal patterns and forces that kept recurring in each human life. These currents had correlations in the cosmos, apparently observed by our ancestors, that tied wandering planets in an ocean of stars to the destiny of our species and of every human to ever draw breath. This is the idea we're exploring today, as above, so below. Our guest today, Richard Tarnas, is author of The Passion of the Western Mind, a deep and thorough explanation of how the human mind and its thinking have evolved over recent millennia and how different eras and individuals have impacted that evolution. Another book of his, Cosmos and Psyche, is why we're here today. In this book, Tarnas makes a brilliant and compelling case for the reality of an archetypal astrology, one that does indeed have a deep and abiding impact on how human lives and minds unfold, one that also transcends the old tire tropes of newspaper horoscopes and mass market mumbo jumbo. I'd always been dismissive of astrology in particular. It seems so obvious to me that celestial objects and their past through the ether could have nothing at all to do with who I am and why. But after my explorations and conversations on this show, our journey together through this strange and wondrous universe, these old certainties lay shattered. If reductive materialism is dying, as I now believe it is, the possibilities of a minded universe and deep running connections become almost limitless. It's these possibilities I want to explore. Welcome to the show, Richard. Thank you very much for, for having me, James. It, it's, uh, it sounds like what you've been doing uh, in in recent years with this with the podcast and with your interests uh, uh, is very much uh, paralleling a, a similar kind of journey I've taken over over my lifetime as well. Yeah, well, let's let's start there. Uh, I mean, you talk a little bit about it in Cosmos and Psyche, how you kind of came into the topic. But if we could recapitulate some of that uh, for our viewers, um, you started out not as someone who was a believer. Am I correct? And over time, that sort of evolved into you becoming uh, an expert. How did that happen? Well, like most people who received a a, 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 a typical twentieth century education uh, and a uh, you know, a good education. You you learn uh, the the basic modern worldview, where, uh, among other things, it's impossible that astrology would work. Um, and there's many other uh, re dimensions of existence that most peoples in the history of humanity have. I won't even say believed in, but felt that they experienced directly. It wasn't a matter of like uh, kind of positing a belief and, uh, and, and saying it just on Sundays. It was more of, a, um, of a, a vivid, visceral experience every day that the world uh, was ensouled and that it was, uh, as you put it, a minded universe and that the intelligence and, and feelings of, of purpose and, and, uh, psychological interiority that we experience as human beings was always felt as being in continuity with the, the the whole universe as that it too has an inner reality and that in fact we are embedded in it and in some sense we human beings are human expressions of of the cosmos we're not just in the cosmos as this unique <clears throat> meaning seeking uh, speck of dust in the vast cosmic void uh, that doesn't have any purpose and meaning. Uh, rather, for most of humanity's uh, history, the conviction has been that uh, 
there that that we are much more embedded in the universe and that we are a microcosm of it and that and also that in you know particular there's particular studies such as the study of the of the uh, movements of the planets and the stars um, but also um uh rituals of uh, rites of passage, initiations, sacred medicine, vision plants, uh, ceremonies, and so forth, that permit one to perhaps enter into a deeper engagement with the, with the uh, depths of the world. Um, and, but like most people who got a, a typical education, in the 20th century, and to some extent, this still is true in the in the 21st century. In places, it's even more true. Um, yeah. We're 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 taught a a, a very different um, cosmology, and which also has an effect on how we view ourselves as human beings, and that is that the human being is has a capacity for consciousness, purposeful, intelligent uh, a, um, uh, awareness and, and activity, uh, a capacity for carrying meaning and communicating meaning, et cetera. But that all these uh, capacities stop at the, at the boundaries of the human cranium uh, because the world outside of, of the human and maybe some higher mammals and uh you know uh, other other animal species may have some dim version of what, what we have but by and large uh we're the we're the top of the pecking order we're the we're the most intelligent uh purposeful awareness known in the known universe and so that kind of puts us in a unique place in the world uh but also uh, an alienated one because we don't we're not at home in this universe. Also, there's a kind of conviction that will be there aren't really any mysteries. There's just uh, puzzles that haven't been solved yet by our by our advancing reason and science and so forth. Um, but the uh, and what's left out uh, of that understanding is just how vast and mysterious the universe is and also the um that there could be consequences to blocking out the the um the understanding of the, the by by blocking out the soul of the world the the anima mundi as it's called in the philosophical traditions um the soul of the world anima mundi by blocking that out and and saying the human being is the only being that carries meaning and that we're in a meaningless universe, uh, that that creates the state of alienation and at the same time kind of inflation, hubris, mm -hmm. um, and in our era, that inflation and hubris seems to have precipitated a a crisis uh, on every level in Absolutely. our time. Yeah. Um, this kind of what we might call the objectification or neutralization of the world. Like it, it doesn't have any intrinsic um, capacities of value, meaning, and so forth, purpose. Uh, uh, it's neutralized. It's just a neutral reality that we can, through our, our rational uh, approach, um, figure out what's really going on and be able to better control and exploit the environment for our own self-enhancement. But that is proving to be a very problematic strategy. Okay, so that's been in the background of your whole life and my whole life. That's been- Yeah, and that's what's driving my journey. I mean, that's exactly, you just succinctly put the arguments that have been I've been making and hearing over the past two years. So well done. Okay, <laughs> so I, th that's in the background of my own uh, personal evolution. But- uh, like many people, you might call us uh, like countercultural intellectuals. Uh, um, if you absolutely, um, 
counterculture, as you probably know, is a term that uh, the cultural historian um, uh, Theodore Rozak uh, coined in 1968 with a famous book called uh, The Making of a Counterculture, uh, where he kind of singled out a number of thinkers who were leading the uh, the the kind of awakening to a, a richer reality that was being carried, particularly you know in 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 the nineteen sixties by a number of individuals, and you know it was the psychedelic revolution. It was the uh, uh, opening up to the the great Asian mystical traditions. It was you know people like Alan Watts or um, mm. the uh, Ram Dass or and so forth. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and so he uh, he coined this term, and a number of us decided to take a, a path that was simultaneously kind of loyal to the to the tradition that we've been educated within, not going totally uh, you know l losing any sense of critical rigor, but at the same time opening up to the fact that <clears throat> there are probably more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in the materialistic mechanistic philosophy that dominates the modern mind. Um, as, as Shakespeare uh, more or less was putting it in, in that famous uh, line from Hamlet. So um, that being said, that's, I've already got a kind of proclivity in this direction that we've been talking about already in the 1960s and uh, early 70s. I, I was an undergraduate at Harvard in those years, and I, uh, I had a professor who had been trained by Jung, um, and Jung, uh, you know, he was a Jungian analyst, but he was also a professor of um, at the Harvard Divinity School during the years that I was at Harvard College. And we became friends. And he, one one day, he we used to have these great conversations about European ideas, intellectual traditions, about Freud and Jung. And like, for example, you might appreciate this because uh, I know Jung has played a role in your own um, work. Uh, this uh, professor said, you know, Freud had the sharp uh, spear, sharp end of the spear, which he, uh, which for him was the idea of libido, the, the sort of primal id energy that is driving human behavior from beneath in the unconscious, et cetera. And, uh, and with that point of the spear of his conviction that this primal energy was shaping the human psyche, it, it, it penetrated the veil uh, that separated consciousness from the unconscious. And he opened up the unconscious as speaking symbolically to us through dreams, through the arts, through psychological symptoms and so forth. Uh, and then uh, my friend said, but Jung comes and he walks through that penetrated veil and he just opens up the whole collect uh, archetypal psyche and and um, which kind of parallels something Joseph Campbell used to like to say. Um, I, I used to be director of programs at Esalen Institute for, for uh, years. And he, Joseph Campbell would come every year and speak for a week at our, uh, at Esalen in Big Sur, California. And he would, he would like to say, uh, Freud was, was um, fishing, uh, sitting on a whale. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> he just didn't quite realize what, what he what he was discovering yeah okay so um amidst these very what i experienced as a young man uh kind of sophisticated discussions um one day this uh, professor said he must have asked me what my birth date was or something because he came in and he started talking to me and said i don't know if you'd be interested but here's where your your sun and your moon and your mars and other planets are Venus and Mercury, et cetera. And, um, and here are some of the significances of uh, the, the meanings of those, uh, those positions. And I just, um, I thought our conversation had just taken an inexplicable dive into the um, dark 
throes of superstition and like what, yeah. what's going on. And as quickly as possible, I steered the conversation back to our high plane of um, <laughs> respectable uh, topics. So it's kind of like, as I've come to realize now, watching it in many people's lives, it's sort of like astrology. You don't just choose astrology. Astrology chooses you in some ways. It 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 knocks on your door. It's almost like a, a it's like the the goddess of of the in of the um of of the cosmic uh panoply of the let's call it the cosmic anima mundi, the cosmic mind and soul, uh that got will tap on your door and you may or may not open the door. I was not ready to open it at that point. Yeah. And it wasn't until I had come years later to, to Esalen Institute, was working on my doctorate. And I was working with Stanislav Grof in particular, who was the, uh, and is, uh, you know, he, he was for half a century, the leading psychedelic um, th psychotherapist and theorist in, in, in the world. Um, he'd been in Prague for many years doing uh, psychedelic therapy in the 1960s and then came to the United States to join the the last of the uh, NIMH, um, you know, National Institute of Mental Health uh, programs that were legally focused on psychedelic therapy in the late 60s, early 70s. At the point that I came to Esalen in 1974, Groff had come and uh, uh, to and become the scholar in residence there. And I uh, wanted, I was, working under on my doctorate, more or less very interested in um, uh, psychedelic therapy, and which at that time was widely seen as being the future of psychotherapy, even though there had been this backlash by conservative elements in the culture. Many, many psychotherapists had experienced the power and the uh, healing capacities of, of this powerful method, not that it, I mean, it needs to be care, be very carefully um, uh, conducted, that type of therapy, which has tr been true for millennia of uh, shamans. They know they, it's, it's, it's a very uh, powerful practice that requires a lot of um, wisdom and, and even courage. Well, yeah. anyway, uh, at that time, psychedelic therapy was definitely considered the future someday we didn't know it would take 40 50 years till the till the uh turn war on drugs ended yeah, or whatever <laughs> yeah the turning turning point has taken place in 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 these last 10 15 years but anyway uh and stan and i were focused on among many other things we were focused on trying to understand why different people could take the same drug same dose uh uh, and yet have radically different experiences. Usually, you know, you, you take uh, a drug and then it has a, a, a pretty frequently observed uh, consequence for the majority of people that take it. Um, and then there'll, there'll be side effects or uh, occasionally it won't have an impact. But with LSD, that completely stopped being true because what they found is that uh, almost anything can happen. And the, some people, there there tends to be a powerful shift of consciousness, new uh, all sorts of um, images, experiences, dimensions can suddenly enter into uh, our, our awareness. And yet uh, some people will have, will be in, ecstatic spiritual uh unity with the with the cosmos and other people taking the same drugs same dosage uh, same even therapist uh would have uh, would be in a panic of of a descent into hell of, and the feeling that they'll never get out and that they're going crazy and that this etc and the the potency of this it was so great that uh of course, there was a, a great desire on the part of the, the therapist uh, to research whether there's some way of kind of getting an, a, a hint in advance of how 
an individual will respond to this particular drug. Um, and yet what happened over the years is that none of the psychological tests worked. They, none of them uh, had an, the standard psychological tests like the Rorschach, the TAT, thematic apperception test, um, MMPI. These are standard psychology tests that are, have been used for, for, for decades. Um, and none of them had any predictive value for telling us which way a person might go. Also, the same person at different times could have radically different experiences. So finally, one day, someone at, in a seminar that Groff was teaching, uh, an artist who also knew astrology well, said to um, uh, Stan Groff that in his experience, the qualities of, uh, of people's um, life experience tends to correlate at any given time with both uh, with where the planets are in the sky relative to where they were at a person's birth. So that you basically have a horoscope or the birth chart of, of a person calculated for the day, time, and place that they were born. And then, um, but you keep tracking where the planets are relative to the birth chart. And those are called transits. Um, like if, for example, we all go through the transit every year on our birthday of the sun coming back to its natal sun position, and that's called the solar return, um, or Saturn does it every 29 years, roughly, uh, and, uh, between age 28 and 30, everybody goes through their Saturn return, uh, because that's how long it takes for, um, for Saturn to to move around its orbit around the sun uh, and also around the Earth because the Earth's inside that orbit. So um, we, both Stan and I, considered astrology the last uh, sort of like esoteric system or new paradigm perspective that could have, we, we just thought of, of it as being over the, over the acceptable plausible paradigm boundary line. And yeah. um, I've come to regard astrology uh, to, to recognize that in the modern era, astrology is basically the gold standards of superstition in our culture. If you want to, if a scientist um, wants to, or a skeptic uh, wants to say uh, this particular way of looking at the world or this theory is is essentially as um, ludicrous as astrology. They they go to astrology to to just say this is not worth giving serious intellectual attention to. Um, so that's the background within which we we were educated and we believe we we were convinced, et cetera. But one thing about those years in the 60s and 70s, just in general, there was more of a kind of experimental, let's see, let's see what the evidence says, even if it doesn't fit the what the what we believe it to be true already. But also uh, at Esalen in particular, it was a kind of, uh, uh, people came from all over the world to teach ancient practices, different esoteric traditions, uh, as well as postmodern like you know, quantum theory and so forth. Uh, and so there was a, an adventurousness and a willingness to respectfully engage a multiple, a multiplicity of uh, perspectives and practices. So we felt on, in good conscience, we, we needed to just investigate it. We learned how to calculate the birth charts and calculate transits. Back then, you had to do that all by by hand, you know, with um, <laughs> calculations and and particular reference works that told you, you know, where the planets were on a particular day, the ephemeris, and and so forth. And lo and behold, to stands in my shock. I mean, we had very good records for each of our own um, uh, psychedelic sessions in in our lives, so we started there because we knew directly what those experiences were like. Um, and 
to to see the precision, the consistency uh, uh, of both the precision and the consistency of correlations between what the textbooks, the astrology textbooks said are the likely kinds of experiences that one might have and what uh, during a particular transit and then what we actually did experience during those transits um, blew us away. And then we started investigating. We had records of Stan's uh, uh, patients uh, over the years that we were looking at, but also Esalen was such a great laboratory because people came to that place to go through powerful transformation. And it wasn't just psychedelic sessions. It could could be spontaneous spiritual awakenings or, um, or uh, you know, a breakthrough that happens in a meditation or all sorts of ways in which uh, people undergo dramatic um, transformations of, of their consciousness and their uh, worldview and so forth. And so eventually I, I just started um, studying hundreds and then thousands, and even moving to historical figures like what did Galileo have when he turned the telescope to the heavens for the first time and saw the what what he regarded as strong evidence for the uh, Copernican heliocentric theory of the universe? And what did uh, Einstein have when he came up with the um, theory of uh, special relativity? So and, just to be clear, you're like on. taking the historic dates and times that you know existed and when they existed and comparing them to their natal charts. And that's able to tell you under what influence they were uh in yes. or under i guess yeah, yeah that's fascinating yeah, yeah that's and to cool see th where there were once in a lifetime breakthroughs right at the time that certain transits that astrologers have for a long time recognized tend to coincide with with um breakthroughs and then to to also note that psychological breakthroughs tend to happen under the same kind of transits that scientists have scientific breakthroughs that uh uh religious uh you know prophets have a sudden um spiritual awakening and uh etc and then there's you know you also get uh when new relationships open up a new romance blossoms etc uh also um periods of depression or personal crises etc it just it became this invaluable tool for comprehending the what Rupert Sheldrake uh, calls when he was uh, looking at our evidence and he said you know what you've shown there is uh, um, the uh, is qualitative time that not the standard view is that time's just quantitative it's four o'clock it's four o six it's four ten. These are all basically neutral times that keep progressing at a, in a linear way. Uh, but the astrological view suggests that time has a qualitative dimension uh, and that a, a, a particular era or a particular period in a person's life can have certain archetypal features that are distinctive to that um, to that moment, like what Jung calls a Kairos moment, um, uh, uh, where the the gods are lined up, as it were, for, for uh, the right moment for a tr for a change, uh, in of, of some sort. So we started um, basically recognizing that number one, astrology, all these years, when it was described, making recognizing correlations, even though it hadn't done the kind of systematic research that I did in Cosmos and Psyche, but there's a, a long noble tradition of people doing uh, all sorts of research uh, that that was was showing these correlations and then they'd write them up in textbooks. And these textbooks were talking about the different meanings of the planets and the transit transits and also what your your basic natal chart or horoscope uh, alignments would signify as an as kind of enduring archetypal tendencies in one's life uh, mm -hmm. that are particular to you. Uh, so what we what I started seeing, you know, I'd I'd been studying, you know, Jung already. I knew, and 
this is another thing is that Jung had been into astrology uh, from like 1911 on and came to re came to use it with all his patients in his later years. I've talked to uh, the psychiatrist who was a friend of the Jung family who, who uh, when I was in Switzerland one time, and, and she was saying that Jung told her directly that although he's not publicizing it, he's using astrology with all his patients because it, it's, uh, this is in the early 50s, um, because it's just so valuable in pinpointing what archetypal uh, patterns, uh, what, what archetypal complexes are, are being constellated at what time, and also in with what kind of emphasis in each individual's chart. So it's just very illuminating for him to have that information. As yeah, and yet another yet, yet another aspect where he was further afield than people dreamed him to be, and he was um, by some criticized for being kind of rather far afield, but he was actually further along than even they realized, and he kept that uh, secret. And I think in some way we're still wrestling with that secrecy because like we're we figure these things out and we pull them out, and it turns out Young was on that trail a long time before we even realized it, and. We may have had the benefit of that for years, except for the fact that he would have just been poo-pooed by materialists anyway. So he was probably right to keep it secret because it would have damaged his career, you know? Very, very true. And I think he was probably almost less interested in, he was a pretty brave guy. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, I th and he pushed the envelope farther than, you know, any other psychiatrist of his time. Uh, and at the same, I mean, you know, bridging to, primal religions, indigenous tra uh, traditions, bridging to the mystical uh, traditions of the East uh, and, and West, um, uh, bridging to religion generally, bridging psychology and science to uh, esoteric traditions and so forth. He was, he was a, uh, a pretty courageous um, researcher and, and it's part, it really came down to a lot of his own powerful experiences, as you probably know from the Red Book period, uh, yeah. in his life from 1913, 1918 or so, he just did a deep dive into a, uh, an inner world that just basically opened him up to the reality of the archetypal psyche, uh, and, um, many other insights that have become much more, uh, widely embraced, even in, uh, like psych psych psychoanalytic circles that had been where Freud had kind of put laid down the limits. A lot of those limits are starting to be uh, opened up within psychoanalysis as well. But just to finish off this this point yeah. with Jung and astrology, I think he was wise to not um, publicize more just how uh, valuable he thought astrology was because uh you can imagine what the Freudians would have done with that in 1950. Uh, Absolutely. And, um, but the fact is, like his daughter became an, an astrologer, Gret Bauman Jung. And um, I know for, for years, people, when uh, Jungian psychiatrists and psychologists, therapists were being, uh, were in their candidate training in Zurich, Switzerland, um, part of their, Rite of passage, so to for, so to speak, would be to get an astrology reading from Jung's daughter. Um, uh, this is in her in her later years after Jung had passed away. So uh, it it's a um, uh, it Jung gave both Stan Groff and me an additional encouragement to start exploring this path. But it was in the end, it was the powerful evidence first within the psychological and therapeutic realm, particularly working with non-ordinary states of consciousness, uh, and, then, uh, and then working, uh, uh, turning the telescope to uh, a different realm of, uh, of, of history and major cultural figures. And, and uh, I was finding it valuable to explore those, partly because I'd spent all my life studying cultural history yeah but also uh i mean it if i were going to write a book that would make a case that this gold standard of superstition had actually had uh extraordinary intellectual value to us 
for understanding the human being, our psyche, but our, also our place in the universe, understanding the universe in a new way, um, et cetera. Uh, if I was going to do that, I needed to present evidence that anybody could check for themselves, namely, when did Galileo turn the telescope to the heavens? Or when did exactly right. uh, Jung have his red book, you know, descent into the unconscious? Or when when did uh, uh, what what transits were going on uh, for Rosa Parks when she didn't get up from the bus uh, in uh, Alabama and initiated the um, the civil rights movement uh, in a whole in, in a whole new um dimension so that that was uh i just felt that would be more compelling than to write about correlations with lsd therapy for example which was already controversial as as stan groff said when we finally found a method that was so uh, accurate and illuminating of uh for understanding the varieties of psychedelic experience it turned out to be just as controversial as psychedelics themselves. <laughs> one of those, one of, one of those ironies. Um, yes. But we just, I've come to see, and I imagine you have recognized this in your own life and journey, uh, that a lot of times the greatest um, kind of secrets of the cosmos or spiritual mysteries are are uh, veiled behind um humble appearances like what could be more scorned than astrology you know it's kind of like the the stable in a main manger a baby born to poor people in a stable in a manger very far from the centers of power in rome um what what major things come going to come out of that nothing you know yeah yeah so it's it's and and that's a kind of paradigm of all uh I think um, deep spiritual truths is that they're uh, they are often veiled uh, within the humblest uh, appearances, and and even that which is scorned can actually be carrying extraordinarily exalted meaning. Yeah, well, th thank you for that. That was absolutely brilliant and uh, enlightening. Um... I mean, I have so many questions about, I mean, revolving around what kind of universe does it have to be for for these things to be true? Um, and in an essay I found of yours online, you talk about three things that often come up when um, people start talking about astrology. And um, they are the nature of archetypes, determinism versus free will, and what makes the astrology work what's the causal mechanism so i'd like to address those for folks uh one of the things that um the nature of archetypes is so interesting to me one of the things that the ufo subject and the uap subject sort of brought to my attention was this discussion of non-human intelligence nhi what they might look like how they might interact with us if they're on planet earth or if they're coming from some other dimension and we're interacting with them i find that uh, subject extremely compelling and um, the archetypal discussion sort of fits within that, in that there's this sense that these archetypes may be intelligent, that they're they're, they're almost beings in a, in a way, and they're related to these personified uh, creations that we have, which are the, the mythical gods, which I find also very, very fascinating and a, a resonance point for, it sort of indicates early glimpses of truth that humanity may have had, you know, and, and that sort of we're learning even now from people who were um, our predecessors after, you know, generations of excusing them and, uh, you know, um, disregarding their wisdom now coming back to it and maybe seeing a deeper kind of, kind of truth. But can you talk a little bit about what the, I mean, if there is a sense or a nature associated with the 10 planets, right. And that includes the sun and the moon, as well as the seven inner planets. What is that? I mean, what what force is that? How does that manifest? Is it a uh, is it just like a uh, an energy gestalt, or how do you conceive of it? Yes. Well, the, this notion of archetypes, which which Jung kind of brought into the twentieth century discourse, 
uh, is, is actually from the Platonic tradition uh, from out of, out of Plato. And um, Plato's understanding of the of the archetypes and the Platonic tradition generally, like Plotinus and and the uh, other great uh, Neoplatonic and Platonic philosophers over the centuries, they basically uh, saw archetypes as being the fundamental organizing powers and principles that pattern all of cosmic reality basically they are the they are the essences of of reality that are that are usually veiled to us um and he would he would say for example um there are many beautiful things in the world uh a sunset's beautiful a, a, a newborn baby is beautiful a, a flower um a, a, a work of music but everything that is beautiful is beautiful to the exact extent that it is participating in the archetype of beauty itself capital b um the principle of the beautiful uh that's beyond time beyond space it 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 can be embodied and localized in in an individual experience or or person or or um uh, phenomenon but it is ultimately uh something that transcends the empirical world and it, you know the famous myth of the cave uh in plato well for plato most of us are what we think of as real actually turns out to be just shadows on a cave that we are uh locked within but that every once in a while, someone breaks out, like a, a great philosopher or an illuminated mystic, um, and sees uh, this greater reality outside of the cave, this powerful light. And the light is 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 basically uh, shining forth the the. It's like the archetypal I ideas or forms, capital F forms. Uh, cosmic forms and ideas that inform the entire universe <clears throat> they are the ulti they are the the reality that is is shaping what we experience as being beautiful or or being good or being uh or or the the horse you know there there are many individual horses in the world but each horse is a manifestation of a kind of archetypal horse you know equus uh, and um people sometimes in in dreams in in uh, artistic epiphanies and so forth get a glimpse of this archetypal horse that's uh transcendent that has a kind of aura of uh the numinous uh around it and um so like from plato's point of view ultimately we want to move from what we think of as an experience is beautiful on this plane and use that as an avenue to get to the ultimate cosmic spiritual beauty, the, which then the religious traditions that conjoined with Platonism, including Christianity um, and Judaism uh, in particular, uh, Islam, the, uh, the Abrahamic traditions uh, in many ways merged with the Platonic tradition so that the Platonic ideas or archetypes were experienced were were seen as residing in God's mind, you know, like wow. a, and uh, and then manifesting through the cosmos. Uh, so that it was this kind of unity between or overlapping uh, presence between the divine uh, and the human and the cosmos. Um, yeah. So the uh i i had been aware that uh for years i've been aware of plato's understanding of the archetypes and then what jung did he he sees these primordial patterns and forms uh that also have this numinous aura around them and also like plato he recognizes that they have a, some kind of connection to the gods as well so that um but but from jung's point of view we don't know, at least in his early part of his career, he said, we don't really know what the cosmos is made of, but we do, we can, as empirical uh, psych 
psychotherapists, psychiatrists, I can see that clearly the, the human psyche is, seems to be ultimately informed by these universal archetypes that transcend culture. Um, there may be, you know, there's, there's, there's many great mother archetypes. There's great, many great, sorry, there's, there's many goddesses, great mother goddesses uh, and mother goddesses in all the different cultures of the world or the hero uh, uh, um, figure that has this kind of archetypal aura around it. And he said, but there's a transcending archetypal hero, capital H, or archetypal mother, capital M, that all heroes or mothers or whatever, including all the mythic uh, expressions of them, are, are ultimately embodiments of this transcendent archetypal reality. So Jung, Jung is recognizing that this is true within the psyche. He doesn't know about the, the world itself. He's gone through, this is too complicated to get into here, but he's gone through the Cartesian and Kantian philosophical re revolutions. So he's no yeah. longer assuming that he can see the universe in itself. He's he's just trying to recognize the instrument that we're seeing the universe with. Uh, yeah. And so Jung views the archetypes as being the fundamental principles of the human psyche. Plato and Pythagoras and so forth, they, they view the archetypes as being the fundamental organizing principles and powers of the cosmos of reality of reality itself and uh suddenly astrology as as jung starts taking in its meaning and he starts seeing geez these this constant sort of synchronicity between the movements of the planets and the archetypal patterns of human experience suggest to me that uh uh these archetypes are not just confined to the human cranium but that they inform all of nature uh, and and not just human awareness and the hu human unconscious. And so astrology, in some sense, became for Jung and for many of us, this kind of royal road that breaks out of the isolated um, uh, chamber of the modern uh, mm -hmm. view of the of the of human consciousness and yeah. recognizes that we're we're in a conscious universe uh and it's a much bigger and richer picture than than we realized and we're so, a part of it <laughs> and that's, we're that's absolutely right. absolutely a part of it rather than being separate or above or yeah so so important and and one other thing that's uh, uh, to get back to the point about what are archetypes uh which i I've kind of unpacked a bit here, but yeah. the fun, one of the fundamental qualities of archetypes is that they, uh, while they inform particular instances, uh, you know, occasions of experience, uh, uh, et cetera, uh, entities of all kinds, they, um, any given archetype, like um, the mother archetype, let's say that we were talking about, can have a, a range of meaning and a what one platonic scholar uh john findley uh philosopher at, at boston university he said um there is an iridescent variation of aspect like a rainbow spectrum of potential ways in which any given archetypal form or idea can express itself so that yeah, there's like a mother archetype, but then you could have the mother archetype could take the form of Kali in India, uh, which has both destructive and, and creative energies involved, uh, 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 but it could take the form of the Virgin Mary, uh, very different under, you know, kind of sense of, of the uh, maternal energy. It can take the form of um, the nourishing womb of the universe but it also can take the form of the devouring mother uh etc so th there's this multivalent range of possible ways in which any given archetype can express itself and that's also true with um with the astrological archetypes or the planetary archetypes um and it's one of the most fundamental things that i i came to realize is that astrology properly understood 
is not concretely predictive. It's archetypally predictive. It can say, uh, it can say, okay, here's here's a period in one's life uh, coming up here for a couple of years where uh, there there's a greater likelihood uh, of new uh, relationships emerging, um, uh, a greater uh, a uh, an exciting new sense of uh, of beauty that can come into your life, artistic uh, innovation. Um, uh, sudden new romances, uh, et cetera. And these are all characteristic of a particular transit, but you can't say in advance which one is going to come through. Um, sure. And uh, so each of these particular events or, uh, yeah, events or, or, or qualities in a person's uh, uh, personality, it, they represent one form uh, in, of, in which that archetype can come through, but it doesn't exhaust all the forms that it can come through. And just knowing that you've got a particular transit can't tell you just by, at, by itself exactly what's going to happen. Um, it's not going to say, well, on... Uh, July 28th, uh, 2025, you're going to, uh, uh, meet this person on the, um, on a bridge in, in, in Paris and fall in love. A tall dark, a tall dark stranger, right? <laughs> right, right. So, uh, that a psychic, a really good clairvoyant or psychic might be able to pinpoint that kind of thing and kind of get an image of it and then convey it. Uh, but, a, and, Astrology can com be combined with that kind of intuitive divinatory uh, capacity. And I think the ancients had more of it, uh, yeah. typically. But um, by itself, astrology gives us a very clear sense of what archetypal powers are being activated at, at any given time. Um, but then it's up to us. This is where human consciousness and, and self-responsibility comes in. Then it's up to us as to how we uh, express this particular archetypal energy that's coming through. And there are forms of the archetype that are very creative and life enhancing. There's other forms that can be quite uh, destructive or corrupt or, or, uh, uh, or trivial um, and, and so forth. So it's really uh, understanding archetypes gives us a handle on human free will because then you can start to see how well yes there is a kind of deterministic dimension but it's mm -hmm. not a fate that locks you into I mean, there may be other one might have karmic destiny that is going to result in a particular person coming into your life a particular uh new horizon opening up at a at, at a specific time um those things yeah there can be quite specific karmic destinies i think um but astrology by itself doesn't tell us uh these kinds of specifics it more tells us the the qualitative features of a of a given um era in our life or period or several day period depending on which planet some move very fast some are slower uh yeah. and so forth so that's why it's so important to understand archetypes as informing astrology because it gives us that greater capacity to understand what are the powers that are coming through what are these complexes and what are they involved and then that allows us to bring more consciousness to our lives uh so that we're not puppets of the archetypes yeah we're we, we we're we're more participants rather than puppets and in that sense we're kind of carrying forward the whole depth psychology project from Freud and Jung on, which was to become more conscious of the unconscious yeah. uh, and therefore to live more skillfully and not be in the grips of unconscious complexes that usually because they're unconscious can uh, wreak havoc uh, because they're, they're operating outside of our um, uh, conscious awareness. And therefore if we don't 
have a dialogue with them or we don't get some discernment of what's going on, we can be quite uh, blindly flailing. Yeah, um, that sort of addressed the free will determinism aspect of those three questions I mentioned. And I want to take a stab at the causal mechanism. I mean, yeah. um, you talk about these uh, powers arising. And to me, I, I get a sense if if you consider the cosmos an ocean, these are sort of like currents and tides that are moving through the universe. And, um, you know, astrology gives us an opportunity I mean, this is going to sound simple, but to surf the current rather than being pulled along, dragged along, or overwhelmed by it. And, um, you know, knowledge is power. And I think that, that increases our likelihood of being able to uh, master uh, you know, temperamental, you know, fate or whatever. Uh, I guess fate might not be the right word because it's it's a looser um, prescription than than that. Um, yeah, I, I appreciate your, your – that's a very good um... – image of the ocean with currents uh, particular currents etc uh and but then the then the question very much does come down to especially for us moderns who want to know like what's 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 the causal uh mechanism that's making this possible that's yeah. that's why astrology could be written off for so long because there didn't there is no causal mechanism that made any sense in a in a newtonian universe etc now a number of quantum physicists have argued that astrology is coherent with uh, uh, certain uh, findings within uh, quantum physics in the, uh, over this past century. Uh, both, uh, yeah, w Will Keepen in particular has done work in this direction. William Keepen, um, and uh, but a apart from bringing in uh, physics. I think, to me, the most com compelling explanation for how astrology works is to recognize that, you know, right now, uh, as we're speaking here, it's four minutes after noon, and uh, the, I, I can look at my clock here and see that it's four minutes after 12. That doesn't make it four, after, four minutes after 12. It indicates it. It's yeah. not causing it. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And that's a good uh, par parallel for understanding the movements of the planets, the sun, the moon. Uh, yes, yes. Is that okay. they they are indicating the where the archetypal dynamics uh, are at that moment in the cosmos that we're all participating in, and uh, but it it is not the planets are not in some mechanistic way causing things to happen here. Mars being overhead right now doesn't make me angry uh, in some, like, as if some sort of gravitational waves or electromagnetic uh, radiation is coming into me and causing me to be this way. Uh, yeah. Someday, with a much more sophisticated uh, understanding of the natural sciences, we may find that there's much more kind of uh, mysterious connections between uh, nature and spirit, and and so forth, uh, as to how how even some kind of causality like of that sort, efficient causality, of, as Aristotle would call it, or mechanistic causality, might be might also play a role. But what seems, from what we can know right now, what's clear is that there is certainly a correlation of meaningful events that uh, of events that have meaning that correlates with the positions of the planets as uh as they've been um observed and uh, interpreted for hundreds of years by astrologers as, as having specific meanings and that there's a real uh synchronous you know p p young thought that perhaps uh, astrology could be understood as synchronicity on a vast scale uh yeah yeah a absolutely a, a cosmic scale uh and so um i think the most compelling description of how astrology works uh it was given by the uh brilliant neoplatonic philosopher plotinus uh when he said uh, a little less than two millennia ago he said um the stars are like are like letters that um 
are inscribed in the in the heavens they they are indicating not causing the 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 kinds of energies that are at, at at operative at any given point and then he said um every all things are full of signs everything is interconnected as has been said everything breathes together everything breathes together now that i i find that a very inspiring image everything Absolutely. breathes together because yeah. uh then you're it's you're 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 more recognizing an integral organic uh unity that underlies the universe through and through above and below inner and outer human yeah. being and non-human uh uh celestial and terrestrial etc um and so that I, I i like that basic understanding which is a kind of platonic jungian um view of uh, uh synchronicity and um a meaningful archetypally informed universe and anima mundi that we participate in yeah, and that's a beautiful conception and it sort of ties together all the sort of mystical traditions and how they have conceived of the world uh i love it one quick question um so if we live in a solar system and we do, and it has a sun and it has the planets, and those represent the forces of these different archetypes. Does that to you indicate that each solar system is a mind and a sort of being or a personality of its own? Or what are your thoughts on that? I mean, because when we say cosmos, we're talking about the local cosmos. Um, so, right. Yeah. Very yeah what, good do you, point. what do you think? Yeah. So, um, uh, even though, of course, astrology is using the whole panoply of the of the stars in the in the background more or less to orient ourselves as to where, where the planets are and the sun and the moon at, at any given point but um uh, the focus has very much been on the solar system for for obvious reasons um yeah. and uh but certainly the strong suggestion would be that the whole cosmos is meaningful through and through and then I, there, there's different possibilities. One is that our solar system, with its particular pantheon of of archetypal powers, uh, may be expressive of <clears throat> more fully macrocosmic archetypes that they that that they they really are universal. But there's another sure. possibility that we're kind of in a, a a what is for us a vast local universe of meaning. But there could be other vast universes of meaning in other uh, solar systems and so forth. Um, the universe is just so vast. Uh, it's just who, who, who knows what's going on out there. But yeah. what you pointed out, uh, again, Rupert Sheldrake has uh, and others have written about the, um, the, the intelligence of the sun um, and and. Uh, an, a number of suggestive indications that there can could be great, you know, uh, consciousness somehow associated with 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 the sun. Um, I know scientists who take that thesis very seriously. Robert uh, Temple, and, have you uh, read any of his work? I have not. No. Well, he talks about the sun and plasma as possibly being a bearer of sentience and intelligence through uh, structures that it can form. But anyway, yeah, yeah it's no, it makes sense because I, I I do believe we live in a panpsychic universe. Uh, every and more and more philosophers are coming to that, uh, kind of breaking out of the hard problem of consciousness and recognizing that consciousness goes all the way down. Um, uh, the 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 increasing embrace of the philosopher Alfred North Whitehead. Uh, and process thought is playing a big role as well. So um, my 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 sense is that th while we can't know uh, for sure what's beyond our our particular solar system, I would g assume that uh, we're not absolutely unique in in the same way that uh, human consciousness is not absolutely unique um i mean it has certain unique qualities but we're in the same way that um uh orangutans and lions have 
certain unique qualities as well. Uh, and so do uh, uh, oak trees. Okay, so in that same way, I, I would guess that the um, our our solar system is not. I we we don't want to be narrowly heliocentric. We don't want to be narrowly anthropocentric, uh, etc. Yeah. Okay. Now, with that in mind, though, um, there is something quite remarkable about the very fact that astrology seem works as it does as so many more and more uh, intelligent, well-informed people are discovering um, who are, you know, you can be skeptical, but as long as you're open-minded and, and engage the evidence uh, in an informed way, uh, you, the anima mundi is waiting for you. I mean, it's yeah. there. Um, yeah. And and I did my best in Cosmos and Psyche to kind of lay out the historical correlations that that would help us op awaken to that that larger reality. It's mind blowing. Uh, the what you point out in the book. I encourage people to read it. Well, thank you. Well, so but this might be a good uh, final point to to um, to articulate sure. in our conversation, and that is the very fact that astrology does work that there are these empirically um, certifiable correlations in such a systematic uh, consistent and nuanced way between planetary movements and the archetypal patterns of human experience it suggests that this earth which after all is a moving earth not not it's a planet not astrology was formed originally in with a with a fixed earth in a geocentric universe um and part of what made astrology seemed impossible uh was the opening up of the idea recognizing the idea that the earth is actually moving um and and therefore kind of loses its um pos position of unique fixed centrality in the whole universe yeah but and and so that actually helps set in motion the um the the sense of disenchantment of the universe and uh a kind of alienation of the human being as being a kind of wanderer in a vast meaningless universe uh yeah. and what what the archetypal astrological evidence brings home over and over to us is the fact that this earth, this moving earth, seems to be a a uh, a focus of cosmic meaning. It's been decentered in a literal way, but we discover that in another way, the earth is a center of cosmic meaning, and that each individual person with their unique birth chart is also uh, a focus of cosmic meaning. And in fact, every moment is as we all participate in what's what we would call the world transits, where the planets are now that all of us are experiencing at any given time. And sometimes entire decades are shaped by an outer planet alignment, such as the happened in the 1960s, or well, we've been through some pretty dramatic ones in our own uh last uh 10 years. Yeah. And absolutely. so um what this suggests to me and many of us is the fact that the universe far from being this indifferent kind of hostile to indifferent to human consciousness hostile to human moral and spiritual aspiration etc far from that being the case the earth seems to be a moving center of cosmic meaning uh and that the cosmos probably has its capacity to be meaningfully centered on many other centers as well, but certainly it is centered on this earth. And that suggests that in some ways, the cosmos, this kind of divinely informed cosmos cares about this earth and cares what's it's it's we're constantly being bathed in meaning. If we had the eyes to see and archetypal astrology 
archetypal cosmology as uh, for the broader study that brings in the philosophical dimensions and so forth, um, helps us recognize this, uh, it's a kind of reunion with the with with the divine essence of the of the cosmos and a recognition that we're 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 just not this isolated stranger in a strange land we actually belong to the universe and in in some mysterious way the universe has cult, cultivated within the human species a capacity for symbolic discernment that is a, and also for telescopic discoveries and so forth, astronomical uh, uh, advances that allow us to be able to see the, these correlations. Even depth psychology in the 20th century has played a great role in helping us to see a deeper level of meaning in the uh, archetypal cosmos. So in all these ways, I think um, archetypal cosmology offers a kind of uh gift from the universe it's like without putting too fine a point on it it's a kind of act of love a kind of act of care that is being expressed and i believe um that taking that in within a context of our own sort of spiritual and moral evolution and initiations and um rites of passage that we go through and so forth that these can allow us to find a kind of spiritual centeredness in a divinely informed, meaningful cosmos that has larger purposes at work that we are participating in. This can give us, uh, many of us uh, can start having a greater sense of uh, basically kind of spiritual and psychological equilibrium as we go through the very profound changes that are upon us as a species, as, as a civilization, as a uh, planet. And um, the more of us that can tap into that spiritual center of, I mean, not to put too fine a point on it, but of, of love, of, of, um, of, of, a, of a larger uh, knowing that there's a larger peaceful intelligence at work in things uh, and that this universe is a, a vast, has vast depths of mystery that we're still in kindergarten and in our explorations of, it can, it can I think, help many of us serve uh, a role in the coming transformations that we'll go through uh, as a uh, species where we can kind of hold the spiritual center, uh, which others can uh, be nourished by in, in amidst the otherwise very disorienting changes. Uh, and where if you are convinced that you live in a meaningless cosmos, those changes could be disorienting indeed. Uh, that of, you know, because basically humanity's going through a kind of near-death experience right now. It's that we're really facing planetary mortality. Uh, and my sense is that this is also a great spiritual opportunity to breaking out of our old identity uh, of the anthropocentrically inflated uh, view that it's man in conscious man in the unconscious cosmos uh, kind of structure of, of understanding and move into a, a much more, uh, a greater state of, of uh, wonder, of, of mystery, of uh, uh, both humility, but also a certain um, dignity that comes from recognizing that ultimately we are the expression of the cosmos, that we're not just these isolated um, uh, beings, but that we, we, we have uh, cosmic depths within us, uh, and that's that's a very ennobling insight when one taps into it. It's like becoming the spy who came in from the cold. Um, <laughs> There's also, I think, some agency that comes along with that, recognizing that we're in some way representative of the universe. 
Um, I very think much. you've. That's a, at... that's, a, that's a great insight. Uh, I think that's very true. Uh, everything that we've been saying here, and uh, is to can serve as a uh, encouragement for our agency, and we could, you know, I, I, I've come to regard the universe as basically having painstakingly over thousands and thousands of years um, helped to shape and constellate a, a, a conscious free partner who would have their own autonomy, their own agency, as, as you put it, uh, and at the same time um, can freely come into a participatory relationship with with the with the whole with the universe with what it had been cut off from and this is this is what the esoteric traditions and Jung called the 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 hieros gamos the the sac the sacred marriage um that overcomes the the opposition and and moves into a a, a redemptive sense of wholeness that preserves our individuality and our agency um mm -hmm. in fact the agency is crucial you can't have a marriage without freedom um or else it's just a a forced uh event but yeah. it, two free beings loving each other and coming into a conjunctio is a uh is is one of the great joys of the universe um wow thank you so much for your time we're at we're a little bit over time so i appreciate your gener generosity with that um and uh if you know if we had endless time. There's, I mean, you talk a lot, a lot more in your book. Uh, the fact that uh, maybe there, there's a karmic relationship to some of this, and whether or not we decide as individual spirits the situations that we incarnate and what the circumstances might be there to present certain challenges to inspire growth. Uh, but that's just a uh, more reason for people to go out and check out your book. And I'll have a link to the book in your disc uh, in the description of the video. And I just really want to thank you for for coming on and sharing your knowledge with us. Thank you, thank you very much. It's been it's been a real pleasure, and um, I appreciate your your um, your range of interests and your own journey that you know allow this conversation to be um, meaningful for both of us.